Hello everyone, welcome to another video, it's Tristan. Also don't forget to check out Mickey's video tonight, that I'll be posting. So, just as we read Zephaniah before and we studied through that book, and in my opinion it, it was underrated, and I don't feel like it was talked, enough, talked about enough, because I never really heard about it. And well, after church service today, I, I felt the same way toward Ezra, and felt a calling to talk about Ezra today. And as I was studying it, I realized it truly starts in Second Chronicles, because there's some history. And just as we studied Zephaniah, I feel like some things can be put to practice from it, because as I, we're going to be starting on verse 15. So, <clears throat> so just as we learned a lot about Zephaniah, about people being made a desolation, and chapter 2 is where a lot of this would be taking place, because there's a person having their store, fortunes restored, and there's a person that's being made a desolation. So, Historical things, uh, if you if you ask my past self, when it came to what we're about to read, I would say that is absolutely boring. But through my knowledge of the scriptures, and through asking the Almighty for understanding, I'm able to find joy in how the Lord is speaking to me through this. Also through understanding the different concepts that Zephaniah talked about, which also check out those videos if there's anything that you're curious about when I mention that book. So, this is where Ezra, in my opinion, starts. Is it goes into when the people of Jerusalem got their, their city back, had to build the wall and all that. And it starts here when they were first received that. And it had to do with God keeping his promise. And it all starts here, which before it too, Second Chronicles is about history, of course, but we're going to jump to verse 15 and read all the way to the end of the chapter to have, give us a good ground for starting the book of Ezra. So, if we look here, it says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, and scoffing at his prophets, till the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. And sometimes it's hard to start way later in the chapter, but in Chronicles we're going to take it as there was an uh, unruly king, that was overthrowing the land and he he was not good and God had to make him a desolation. It says until there was no remedy. And when I realized I had to read Second Chronicles to understand Ezra, and I read this, it brought to mind how my uncle Mickey was actually talking to me about this on the phone one day, about how there's no remedy. And it's interesting how there can be that threshold where to where Maybe, maybe not, somebody could get to the point where God has to take them out. Make them a desolation if they're unruly enough, if they will not, if they're not able to return again into repentance. Which, it's a really deep subject. Yes, it is really hard to understand. But, through asking God for understanding, and doing our best, and we're going to, Read the next verse. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on the on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. God made them a desolation, the wicked people that would not repent. God probably knew ahead of time that they would never repent. He might have not felt a need for them to be in the in the world anymore. Just as like just as like the 
since the start with Sodom and Gomorrah, we, we see how people can become so wicked that they have to be taken out. It says, In all the vessels of the house of God, great and small. There's that great and small again, which is mentioned a lot throughout the word. Just as great and small will be have to kneel their knee before God, it says in Revelations, in the great white throne judgment. And this keeps bringing my mind back to everything Zephaniah taught us. And it actually helps us with this historical side. Because it says here, And the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all of these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. There's the broken wall. And burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. And just wiped it out to where, like Zephaniah said, there will be hedgehogs and owls. There will be hedgehogs and owls because of how desolate the place will be. And it will be a place for grazing for sheep and shepherds. And that's what Zephaniah says. The fortunes will, will be restored upon certain people. Which God knows will repent and are the wicked, the truly wicked people. People that aren't able to be saved. Which is a scary, scary sound. People without that remedy. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. And the reason why we didn't get into this subject right here too much is because this is really where I wanted to touch on is what we're about to get into right here about the kingdom of Persia being established. To, the fulfill, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. See, this is where we have the prophet Jeremiah coming into play. Also, as it's talked about in Ezra, that we'll get into. It says, Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. And my mom was just talking to me about how in Leviticus, she said she remembers it talking about something along the lines of, a land having a Sabbath, uh, like, you would do crops for seven years, and a year you would do a Sabbath. I don't know the exact verse, but I think here, it, in my opinion, it might just be referring to the fact that it was not used. And it was barren. It was a desolation. But it, referring to a Sabbath is very interesting. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, now this is where the God, God's promise starts to come in right here. Because through the slaying of people, through people having no remedy, God's people still was able to be exalted by the Almighty. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. The spirit being stirred up is very, that's very interesting. And it sounds like he had this calling here. It says, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. He put his calling into action, in my opinion. It says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Whoever's among you. Okay. That's where it starts in Ezra 1 1, where it continues the talk of of Cyrus King of Persia, which we can 
read this first verse because it relates actually with Second Chronicles, which is why we started there before Ezra. But I feel Ezra is underrated. It's not really talked about. I've never heard anybody quote a scripture out of it. So we're going to study it throughout the times I post my videos. And here it continues Cyrus, king of Persia. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Again, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, as it says in Chronicles, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And understanding some of the backstory behind that was also really good. Because here it says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now it's interesting how it repeats it here and in Chronicles, because they were, they were really trying to preserve all the historical, in my opinion, trying to re preserve all the historical things that God did in their life. And I love how through this historical stuff here, we, we are able to see what Zephaniah taught us being put into place, being put into place here. And we also, at the same time, we're able to see how the Lord keeps his promise because through the people that it talked about let's go to that verse it says here we go he took into exile in Babylon those who escaped from the sword <clears throat> and this could have been God's people and the fortunes were restored to some people and some were made and the whole kingdom was made a desolation but either way, it's interesting how not every single person was slain and the prophecies and God's promise and his love was able to able to continue. Even after all these people being slain, God provides the king of Persia and gives him a calling. And God is a just God. He will do good and evil. Also as Zephaniah mentions. And all, all, just by reading 2 Chronicles 15 through 21. We are able to. And actually all the way through to the end of 2 Chronicles. We are able to see how God does that good and evil. And it's interesting how much. As after studying Zephaniah, how much that book comes to mind through these verses we've read. Because the desolation, fortunes restored. And it's beautiful how God keeps his promise to where the book of Ezra happens. God allows people to have Jerusalem back. God provides a way of escape from the sin of the world. And God is a just God. And we are his creation. And we hold the glory of God through Christ. And I appreciate everybody that's been watching my videos. And I'm excited to be starting off in Ezra chapter 3. Starting next week. And I hope everybody has a blessed night. Thank you for watching.